بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا ابا القاسم محمد وعلى ال بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وارواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. شاء الله as we commemorate the tragic, tragic incident of the desecration of the shrines of our beloved imams that are located in the sacred lands of the Baqiya tonight. We want to send our heartfelt condolences first and foremost to our Imam, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman as such a tragic, tragic event. And inshallah, tonight we want to look into particular aspects relating, inshallah, to the desecration of these holy shrines. What may have led people to do so? And why is it important? To look, to look into and defend the aspects which are upholding and elevating the shrines of the Ahl al-Bayt and the pious people. And inshallah, tonight we want to look at this topic and try to give this topic its essence in five particular stages. First and foremost, we want to look at the importance of such events. Secondly, we want to take the Islamic perspective on two particular aspects. Number one is the time, the importance of time. And insha'Allah, the importance of a place. So that's three. Four, we want to look at the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how is it we can relate tawheed with elevating and upholding such shrines, such places of worship. And on the reverse angle, how is it that it's kufr to go against such sha'ar. Now that's number five. And finally, inshallah, number five, we want to look at a particular verse in the Holy Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in houses that Allah has instructed that they be elevated and his name remembered. And that's from chapter 24 of the Holy Quran, sign or ayah number 36. Fi buyutin adin Allah and in houses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote and prescribed that they are elevated and in it his name is remembered. Insha'Allah we want to look at these particular aspects. Insha'Allah please help me in starting tonight's topic and sending the reward of a salawat to our Imam Sahib al-Asr wa zaman with three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. As we see within every single religion that may come forth from the time of Adam up until the final messenger, up until nowadays, there is an importance and a significance that we can see that every single religion that has come has in either the time frame or the places of worship. As an example, when we look at Judaism or if we look at Christianity, there's a particular aspect and the significance towards their structures, such as the churches, such as the synagogues, as in there are certain ways in which you may enter, certain days in which you may enter these premises, certain ways you should conduct yourself in particular premises. Because why? Because this is a place of worship. This is a place where Allah is remembered. This is a place where it is 
sacred and is a sanctuary from the outside world. Now, that's first and foremost. We know that there's a significance. And we know that everyone strives for that perfection, that level of perfection. And that's why we pride ourselves in being the followers and the people that hold on to the rope of Allah better than anyone else. Because as the final messenger came to complete the religion of Allah, because we know the religion of Allah isn't any particular religion. All the religions come down to one particular aspect, which is Al-Islam. Submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now with that all done and finalized, we want to look at all these aspects. We know that each and every one of them has a significance in time frames and particular aspects of structures and their locations. Now let's look at Islam. Let's look at what Islam says. In two aspects before we go on to look at Immatul Baqiyah. First and foremost is a time frame. In the Quran, there's a significance given to time. As we can see, in the Quran it is mentioned that it's Laylatul Qadr, isn't it? Number one, that means it's a time frame. Layl is means night. Particular aspect. Why is it Laylatul Qadr? Why isn't it in, in the daytime? Allah puts a significance. He puts a significance on the date in which your du'a is accepted. He puts a significance this night, this holy night that has just passed in the holy month of Ramadan is worth that of a thousand months. One night worth a thousand months is yes. Significant or isn't it significant? It's significant. Therefore, that's one. Another aspect, even in Salat, we may overlook it. Why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts an emphasis on particular time frames? Subh, there's a particular time frame, it becomes mustahab, and then becomes qada, doesn't it? After a particular time frame, time frames, Allah says, in a daily perspective, not only in significant aspects, dua, tawassul is a particular date on Tuesdays. When you look at dua, kumail, particular night, wasn't it? On Thursday. Dua You can read it every single day, not a problem. But the reward is there when? In a particular time frame. Salatul Layl, can you pray it in the morning? Why? Everything has its secrets. Everything has its rewards. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it for us. And it's not, it's not like we can't explain it. There's explanations for it if you want to look into depth of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put and installed such attributes and such circles that we have to learn these particular aspects so first and foremost we find that there is a significance in time how can we apply it to the place Imam Hussein alayhi afdalu salati was salam because we know our imams their knowledge is divine uh, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now when Imam Hussein alayhi afdala salatu wasalam on the 9th of Muharram, the 9th of Muharram, we know he was martyred on the 10th, isn't it? On the 9th of Muharram, the enemy tries to attack Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein sends Abba Fatl al-Abbas and Ali al Akbar towards the opposition army. Why? He says, give us sawad hadhi al-layla. Why? Because Imam Hussein knew there's a significance on dying on the 10th of Muharram, not dying on the 9th. Even we move on to the, to the, to the place Imam Hussein knew. People came towards Imam Hussein alayhi afdalu salati was salam. And they said what? They said after you want to move from Mecca, go towards Yemen. That was the first suggestion for Imam Hussein. Go towards Yemen. Don't go towards Kufa. He says why? He says in an instant that Imam Ali, Ali, ibn, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi afdalu salati was salam was a judge there once upon a time. So he has followers in Yemen. He says no, I'm not going to Yemen. He says how about you go towards Egypt? Masr, why don't you go towards Egypt? As in, Malik al Ashtar was supposed to go and govern there. Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr used to go and govern there. He has followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, I'm not going towards Egypt. Other places were given to Imam Hussein. He says, No, I have a mission. I know where I have to go. There's a significance of the place. He gets towards Karbala when he stopped. He asks one of his companions, What does he say? He says, What is this land? To show you there's a significance of the place. And we want to relate it towards A'immatul Baqiyah and the significance of their place. He says, what's this land called? He says, Nainawa. He says, is there another name for this land? He says, Shatil Furat. He says, is there another name? Al-Ghadiriyat. 
Is there another name? He says, yes, O oh, Imam. It's called Karbala. He says, this is the land. Karbon wa bala. This is the land that's promised. This is the land that's important. Give us a significance. Imam Hussein alayhi afdal salati wa salam. That's land till tonight. Till this very instant, to this very second. If you have, or if you pray on the Torah from that particular land, significance of that land, if you pray on it, this particular aspect of when you pray, this particular levels that you have to reach in order for your prayer to be accepted. If you prostrate on that particular turba of Imam Hussein, you have your knee and your salat accepted. A blind man comes towards Imam Hussein's shrine to show you the significance of, of this particular haven on earth. He comes towards it and he takes a bit of the sand and he smells it. He says, this is where Imam Hussein is buried. The person looks at him and says, how do you know you're blind? How do you know this is where Imam Hussein is buried? He says, I've been working with fragrance my whole life. He says, I know after 20 years of working with fragrances, this fragrance is not from this earth. This fragrance is from the heavens. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore we find, just in the instance, just in the ideology and the story of Imam Hussein alayhi afdal salati was salam, that there is a significance in particular places. There is. Number one, there's significance in time. I'm trying to cut it really short, inshallah, within the time frame that I have tonight. But it's a very, very elaborate topic if we want to go into depth. But I'm trying to go over particular aspects in it to join it up and wanting to relate it towards A'imat al baqi and the importance of upholding such structures. So there's a significance in time, number one. Number two, there's a significance in a place. Now someone may come forth and say, well, and we have been attacked, saying, well, because you uphold such places, because you uphold such shrines, you are kuffar. Up until tonight. Isn't it why it was desecrated? Because they say, why? Because you go towards Allah through them, you go and prostrate to Allah through them. You go and hold on to them and ask for Allah. Therefore, you are doing kufr and therefore we will desecrate it. Up until tonight. People still believe that ideology. Now, I want to take this and I want to analyze it and I want to defend it. And I want to look into the aspect of tawheed. And I need everyone's concentration in its very finest tonight. Look at this aspect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us praying, fasting, reading Quran, Hajj, Amr al-Ma'roof, Nahi an al-Munkar, ila akhirah, yes? We have all these aspects that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you have to do. Now I want to ask you, when you pray, is the prayer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa'iyadha billah? Or is the prayer a means towards Allah, wasila ila Allah? Is that a question? Is praying Allah billah, or is praying a means to Allah? When you pray, you want to gain closeness towards Allah. When you recite Quran, you want to gain closeness towards Allah because He said you have to do this. Allah says you have to pray, therefore we pray. Allah says you read Quran, therefore we read Quran. Allah says fast the month of Ramadan, therefore we fast the month of Ramadan. Now the question here is what? If all these are means towards Allah, wasata to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where is it that we can say, when Allah in the Quran says, hold on to my rope, what's the rope of Allah, I ask you? Is it the salah? Is it the siyam? Is it the worship? Or when we look at the ahadith, Allah in the Quran says, hold on to my rope. That rope that Allah says hold on to is Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> now if, if in one hand all these are means towards Allah, how can you say that the rope of Allah, which is the most important, which without this rope, no other worship is accepted. Isn't that an important means towards Allah? When Allah says, hold on to them, remember them, learn from them, follow in their footsteps. 
because they follow my message the best. Some people come forth and say, well, it's shirk. I want you to go tell those people. If you want to hold on to someone to go towards Allah, I want to ask those people if they don't believe in such a thing as means towards Allah. And there's a massive problem with this. These people go and ask them, when you're sick, don't go towards the doctor. And they say, why? Tell them, if you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the curer, don't go towards the doctors. Just pray to Allah and he will cure you. Don't go towards the doctors. Why is he going towards the doctors? If you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't given you a means, that you should only go towards Allah by seeking Allah, by making dua to Allah. Allah has given us a brain and he's given us his means on earth. If you want to get a cure for your disease, Allah has given you a doctor to go towards to get cured. Who nowadays that's sitting here just says, well, I'm sick. I'm not going to go towards the doctors. His critical sickness, he doesn't go towards the doctors. Everyone will go towards the doctors. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it that way. That there are people that have this particular expertise. These people that have this particular expertise. The Ahlul Bayt have all the expertise. That's why we hold on to them. That's why we remember them. But the main aspect is not towards what? Towards the madhab. It's in order to desecrate their shrines. So we may not remember them. So we may not go towards them and remember them Instilling what? The remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all a chain. It's all a chain. It's a domino effect. And they think if you destroy one, you won't get towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They'll think if you desecrate their shrines, their names will not be remembered. But 1,400 years ago, that's what they thought. And in 1,221, when they first desecrated the baqiyah after death, AD, they thought that was the case. And again, in 1925, when they desecrated it once again, and they think, what? That they will remove the remembrance of Allah's messengers on earth, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mirror images of his attributes, personification of his message on earth. They think they'll desecrate it with them. But how many people do we know from the start of time from Imam Hussein alayhi afdal salatu was salam when they've tried to attack us and they've tried to kill us and bomb us and not allow us to go towards the ziyara unless they cut off a limb back then did it stop? look at us nowadays in the Guinness World Records the biggest gathering in such a small space not one, two, three years running. That's, that's the message and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet Allah is above their hands. The hand of God is above theirs. They plan and Allah is the greatest of planners. That's the aspect of Tawheed. Now we have people that think that they, they, they don't need Ahl al-Bayt. When we talked about in, in, in Ramadan a few weeks ago, when we looked at the perfection of the acts of the Prophet of Islam, what did we say? We say even in his movements there's perfection. How? He says when he talks about kafilul yatim, he says kahatan fil jannah, doesn't he? And he points with two of his fingers that are not the same size. One has extra. One's missing something. They're not the same size. Therefore we know that the Prophet when he says, me and the person that sponsors an orphan are like these two in heaven. There's obviously, obviously ranks. The Prophet's not in the same position as that person because of not the same size of those fingers or the positions of those fingers. But when the Prophet Hawa, he does not talk of his own accord, he takes the two exact same fingers in the same positions in his hands. And he says, hold on to two. And if you hold on to these two, you will never go astray. And he points with these two fingers, the exact same. Instilling what? That the two things that he's about to mention 
are mirror reflections of each other. One is not greater than the other, nor is one less than the other. They're in equivalence. And he says, Kitabullah wa itrati ahla bayti. Sallu ala Muhammad. He says the same too. Because if you don't hold on to them and their teachings and follow in their footsteps, you'll have people like nowadays. Less than 10 years ago, he passed away and he says every single person that doesn't believe that the earth is flat is a kafir. We have nowadays, till now, people that say that. If you don't believe that the earth is flat, you're a kafir. That's what happens when you don't believe in these two. When you don't hold them side by side. That's what happens. When the Quran states about the earth, earth and it uses the word dahaha, what does it mean? Two movements. Number one, if it's a ball, it rotates within itself and it rotates in a movement or in an orbit. One word, one word of the Holy Quran, dahaha, one word, it explains the entire circulation of the earth around the sun. One word. And that person thinks that he can do without the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt, and says the earth's flat. That's the perfection of Ahlul Bayt. The perfection of their word. The perfection of the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But less do they know that the people that can translate the Quran and the depth of the Quran, the best, and the only people that can are Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> only people. And that's why the people had knowledge of this. That's why they desecrated their shrines. That's why they tried to remove that which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's place of worship on earth. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Iblis, because people nowadays, they say, no, do not worship in such places. Do not worship Allah or do not remember God in such places where people are buried. Do not remember it. People nowadays, they say, that's why they desecrated the shrines. I want to ask a question. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a certain aspect between tawheed and kufr. Very fine line. He says to the angels, now think it with me. He says to the angels in the Quran, bow down to who? Who does he say bow down to? Adam. Now nowadays, if someone bows down in submission to someone, is it that kufr or isn't it? It's kufr. If you bow down to someone except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when Allah says bow down to that person, it becomes tawheed or not? It becomes tawheed. Allah says to the angels, bow to Adam. And then everyone bows except Iblis. Iblis, what does he say? He says, I want to bow down to him. I want to bow down to you, O Allah. Nowadays we have people. Don't worship Allah in these circles. Don't worship Allah where someone is buried. Worship Allah straight away. Don't hold on to the means towards Allah. Iblis said that. After 6,000 years of worship, Iblis said that. Was the first to say that. It was taken down. He says, I want to worship Allah straight away. The Khawarij says, no, don't hold on to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Just hold on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll be fine. Well, Allah's telling you hold on. Like that person that was about to drown. He fell off a boat, as the analogy goes. One ship comes past, he says, no, Allah will save me. Another ship comes past, says, Allah will save me. Third ship comes past, Allah will save me, the guy drowns. He comes on the day of judgment and says, oh Allah, I told you to save me, I believed in you. Allah says, I, I sent you three boats. What else do you want? That's what we have nowadays, brothers and sisters. Allah has given us so many signs. So many signs to hold on to. People don't understand the aspect which is the wasila to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As in you have to know who Allah is. You have to know how Allah operates. You have to know the attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you know that, you'll begin to understand when Allah says, hold on to my rope, the importance of that rope. Being the Ahlul Bayt. Being the people of the book. Who is the dhikr? The dhikr is in the Quran is mentioned. As who? As the Prophet of Islam. The family of the Prophet is Ahl al-Dhikr. Then who do we have to go and ask? Who do we have to go and learn from? When Abu Dhar is asked, is asking the Prophet, says, Oh, Prophet of Islam. He says, How can we attain a greater rank amongst the companions? 
I want to elevate ourselves. Don't we all want to elevate ourselves? I want to become higher in the eyes of Allah. The Prophet says, go outside and you'll see how you can elevate yourself. He goes, he says, Ali ibn Talib walking, he sees Salman al-Farisi or Salman al-Muhammadi walking after him. He looks at Salman, salamu alaykum, alaykum salam, what's happening? He says, you're walking awkwardly. He says, Ali ibn Talib just passed. He says, yes. He says, what are you doing walking like that? He says, look on the floor. Look at the footprints of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, I want to live my life in such a manner that wherever Ali ibn Abi Talib puts his right foot, I put my right foot. Wherever he puts his left foot, I put my left foot. That is the aspect in which the Prophet says to Abu Dhar, to elevate yourself, you have to do as Salman does. That's what we have to take into our lives. And inshallah, I end by stating the verse in question. Verse from chapter 24, ayah number 36, in which Allah says in houses that Allah has instructed to be elevated and his name be remembered in there. We look at particular narrations, not from our books. Not from our books. There's so many in our books. Let's look at the other schools of thought. What did they say? about this particular verse and who it is in reference to. Who is it in reference to? One of the people is known as a Thalabi. In his book, he narrates, in chapter 7, page 107, and this is being recorded. You can go and look it up, in, 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 look it up and look at that particular aspect in which this verse is looked into and translated. That's one person of the many that you can look into his book. And he says, when the Prophet is instructing this verse, and he says the verse, one man stands up. That man says what? He says, who are these houses, O Prophet of Islam? and turfa. To be elevated, to be erected, so his name may be remembered. He says, who are these houses for? The Prophet replies by saying what? He says, these are the houses of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which he says the prophets and the awliya. Now look at this reference, not from our books. He says, then Abu Bakr stands up, the first Khalifa. He looks at the Prophet and then he points at a house which was the house of Ali and Fatima. And he says, O Prophet of Allah, is that house one of them? First aspect. Why didn't he say, is my house one of them? Why didn't he say, any other companion's house one of them? Why did he point at the house of Ali and Fatima and say, is that house one of them? That's one aspect in which it's food for thought. I'll let you think about it, that, that one. Now the aspect is what? The reply of the Prophet. He says, yes. Not only is it one of those houses, it says, بَلْ أَفْضَلِهَا صَلُّوا عَلَى مُحَمَّدُ وَعَلَى Inshallah, my time has come to a close, but I want to, inshallah, just wrap up everything for tonight. And I want to leave you for the wise words, inshallah, of the Shaykh. The aspect that we want to learn from tonight. The main aspect is why was this and why were the shrines of the Baqi'a desecrated? And we know now that they believe that this was kufr. They believe that in order to desecrate these shrines, they think that they will lose the remembrance of the people buried in there. Little do they know that one of the people that were buried is the person that was the teacher of all four of their schools of thought. Little do they know that one of the people that are buried in there is the person that the Prophet of Islam says he is Sayyid Shabab Ahl al Jannah, one of the youth, of the guardians of the youth of paradise. And, 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 we don't have time to go and mention each and every one, but each and every one has a prominent position and a pulpit in which we, we can learn. If we only hold on to one of them, it suffice if we follow in their footsteps. Only one of them. And that's what they think. That's why it's our job and it's our duty from tonight 
to remember them. It's our duty to learn more about these people's lives because they have a madlumiyya. Because they have a madlumiyya. Why? Because they are not visited. I end on one note. Sheikh Jafar Kashif al Ghata. One of the greats, and I end on this particular story, and I have apologies for taking too much of your time. Once he says to himself, that's why is it that Fatima al Zahra had three particular aspects in which she has buried? Three particular times that we remember Fatima al Zahra. He says, I want to study to relate one particular time, one particular date in which we can commemorate Fatima al Zahra's martyrdom. So he goes and he researches and researches and researches. Until he finds a particular time in which Fatima Zahra was martyred. The date of Fatima Zahra's martyrdom. And he's about to write the fatwa. He's about to write this particular aspect. His wife comes to him. Look at the beauty of this narration. His wife comes to him. He says, she says to him, Oh my husband, what's with you and Fatima Zahra? He's looking at his wife, he's thinking, how does she know what's, what I'm doing? How does she know what I'm looking into? He says, he says, why? What did Fatima al-Zahra tell you? She replies by saying, Fatima al-Zahra told me to tell you, do you think that it's too much that I'm remembered on three different occasions? She says, because I don't even have a grave where someone can come and visit me. Look at that narration, brothers and sisters. After that, Sheikh Jafar left that particular aspect in honor of Fatima al-Zahra and says, yes, let us remember Fatima al-Zahra. In that aspect, let us remember these imams that have brought us everything that we have today. We want to remember them. That's the aspect we have to take from tonight, inshallah. When we pray to Allah on that aspect and that note, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes that the Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman can come so we can elevate these shrines again, rebuild such shrines so we may go and visit our beloved Imams, that we crave to go and smell the dust that is laying there. We pray to Allah. With a fatiha, but before it, three of your loudest salawat, ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.